Thank you to all of our musicians today. Appreciate each message you brought to us. Even Trudy over there. Didn't she do such a fabulous job on the organ? Trudy. You turn red yet? Are you working on it? You got anything to say? You want to stand? You, you need anything you need to say this morning? Okay. All right. Thank y'all. Title of the message today, and I want you to write this down if you would. Title of the message today is In Position for the Mission. In Position for the Mission. The question is, are you in the right position in your life to fulfill the mission that God has given us, the one that you just saw um, on our screen, Matthew 28, 19 through 20. Um, Before I get into that, I want you to write down this special date, March the 16th. So if you were signing a document, chances are you wouldn't sign it March, spell out March uh, the 16th and two th- you wouldn't spell out March. I do that on my checks. I don't know about you, but a lot of times what do we do? We just do 3-16-22. And so um, obviously when you think 316 as a Christian, one of the things that comes to your mind is maybe John 316, right? And so there was a lady in our church that sent me a video. It was about a minute and a couple of seconds long. And it had to do with this idea that came from out west. So I don't want you to think, I'm not, I'm not, taking credit for the idea, but I am stealing the idea, okay? And so there's just going to be this big emphasis on this day of really encouraging uh, their people and encouraging other people all over the world to just share the gospel on that day. So again, you could study about that, but that's not the point. When I heard it and saw the video, this is what I felt like God put in my heart. Two things to do with this date, all right? With this date, we have the opportunity, A, to put emphasis and focus on the mission, the mandate that we have been given from God, okay? It's not an option, right? It's not, you know, well, you do have an option. You don't have to participate. But, but, but as far as what we're called to do, the mission is there. It's set in stone. It cannot be changed, all right? So it gives us a chance, number one, emphasis. That's a key word, focus on on what the mission really is, to talk about that as a family, as a body. Number two, it gives us the opportunity, though, to challenge people to actually engage. So you've got the emphasis of the mission, but then engaging in the mission. Now, here's the thing. I don't ask you this to embarrass you or to intentionally, like, offend you and make you mad at me. But I just wonder, like, let's just say in the last year, how many people have you d- have done what we just sang about? How many of you have actually told someone about Jesus because you desperately want Jesus to change their life like he's changed your life? So here's my thought, right? I don't know, and I don't know percentages, right? But I wonder how many of us are really sharing the story of Jesus, how many of us are going beyond just being nice and doing good things to actually telling people how to be saved from sin and death, which was a reality for you, whether you realize it or not, from the day you were born. From the day you were born, it's been a problem. So how many of us are really talking about the solution that God has given us, the Savior, Jesus Christ? So, so again, with this emphasis that we're going to place over the weeks and coming weeks, on 316, it is going to be, number one, an opportunity to emphasize the mission, but number two, an opportunity to challenge you to engage. So I want you to start praying right now because some of you have people around you you know that are lost, but you have never engaged them, and you've never taken the time to share with them your testimony or tell them actually the good news of Jesus, how they can be saved, right? Because if this were about being good people, then there are a lot of good people around us. That would be the message. Just be good. Just do right. Just help others. But that's not it. What Adam did was a big deal. What he did was passed on to every single one of us that's come after. And so every one of us are sinners and every one of us are born spiritually dead. 
Now, I understand that raises a lot of questions for children and maybe those who've never heard, and, and I might get you distracted with all of that this morning, but we were talking about that in Sunday school. But anyway, the Bible says the only way you can be saved is to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, you shall be saved. But how in the world can a world call upon the one to whom, the only one that can save them if they never hear about them? And so I really believe this is going to be a challenge for you to start praying now, praying that God will open a door. If it's that day, great. I don't want to get hung up on the day because you and I both know it's not just about one day. This is a lifestyle, right? But we want to help foster that lifestyle to where we're thinking and living that mission every day of our life. So we'll be talking about that. But I'm thinking that why is the mission not be carrying, being carried out today? And what God has shown me, the reason that the mission is not being carried out by the majority of professing believers because we're not in the right position. And really that has to do with more of a position from the heart. Okay? And it's got a whole lot to do about this word worship. So we're talking about getting in position for the mission because that is exactly and sometimes I'm slow, okay? You have to bear with maiden people, okay? You just have to give them a little bit of patience because it might take you a day. It's going to take me at least a month, okay, for everything to kind of settle in. But just in light of what I've been teaching here recently, I've come to realize that God is moving his people into position to fulfill the mission that he's given us. Now, the sad part about that is, and I'll go ahead and admit it to you, some people are going to hesitate. Some people are going to doubt. And some people are going to continue on the same path. But I tell you, God is wanting to move us into the right position so that we can carry out our mission. Matthew chapter 28 verse 16 says this. Then the 11 disciples, of course, why does it say 11? Judas has jumped ship, right? Right? I mean, and you think about old Judas. I mean, I didn't intend to say this, but poor old Judas, the Bible actually records his suicide. You remember that? What did Judas do? He hung himself. And, and it goes even beyond him hanging himself. It, it, it actually gives you the details that he hung himself and, and, and literally he burst open and, and his, I'm sorry, but his bowels, his, the, they were laying out on the ground. And I asked God, I said, God, why, God, did you give us these details? You know what it's a picture of? You really need to hear this, man. And by the way, I'm challenging you with everything I have. If you don't write this down, you are not going to remember what I said. I'm pleading with you. You know what Judas is a picture of? It's the picture of a wasted life. He had been with Jesus all that time. He had received everything that all the other disciples got. But he never did anything with it. And there's some of you sitting in these pews, you're slammed packed full of truth, but you're doing absolutely nothing with it and you're wasting your life. You think you're just going to just toss a little bit out every now and then when it's just absolutely convenient for you, and, you know, and that's going to be okay. No, it's not going to be okay. It's not going to mean you're going to go to hell instead of heaven. It's not, not that God's going to take that life away from you, but you are going to have to stand before him at the judgment seat of Christ. You're going to have to give an account. You're going to, have to, you're going to have to give an account of what you've done in this life and in our service to him. So the 11 come together in Galilee to the mountain of which Jesus had appointed for them. And when they saw him, they what? What did they do? What did they do? Interesting. All these years, I've never seen that. But the 11 gather, and the Bible says they worshiped him. What, did, what, what does that mean? What were they doing? But it also says that some what? They doubted. They doubted. And Jesus came and he spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. So let me just ask you church a question. Is there any greater authority? 
If there is a greater authority in this world than Jesus, guess what? This book cannot be trusted, and he is a liar. All authority that's in heaven and earth has been given to me. Jesus said that. So let me ask you something. Who's really in control? It's really Joe Biden, right? He's really in charge of this thing, right? Yeah, he is. Come on, get on board with me, y'all. Now, y'all know better than that. All authority has been given to me. Who's saying it? It's Jesus. So then look what he says. What does he say to his disciples? Who will then in turn say to their disciples, whose disciples will then in turn say to their disciples, what? Go. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. What else? Teaching them to observe all the things that I have commanded you. And guess what? I'm going to be with you every step of the way. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. In position for the mission, I must real quickly, using this text, remind you what is the mission. What is the mission? Because here's the thing. This is not about my vision for all of it. It's not about my plan for all of it because the vision is already in place the plan is already in place all God needs are people who are willing to take the vision take the plan and put it into action how liberating is that just take his vision just see how he sees take his plan his strategy and just go do it The text says in verse 19, and I understand that that go may sound like the major verb of this text, but it's not. It's not the main verb. It is actually a supporting verb. And as you have heard many times before, and you've heard me say it, it could be translated Jesus saying, as you boys go, as you live your life, every single day, every moment, make disciples. See, there's your mandate. There's your mission. Make disciples is the main verb. So the mission that you and I have been called to that cannot be changed, you can change it. You can adopt some other mission, but the mission that Jesus handed his disciples was turn men into disciples. So then the question is, well, what is a disciple? You've got to understand that a disciple is not a convert or just a professing believer. Salvation is only the beginning. When we tell people about Jesus, we're giving them an opportunity to believe on him and enter into a relationship by where they follow him or to essentially become one of his disciples. So what is a disciple? Write this down. A disciple in general, using the text of scripture, using the culture in which Jesus lived, a disciple is this. It is a committed, lifelong learner and follower. That's what a disciple is. If somebody became a disciple of Rabbi Jehabashashim or whoever, I don't know, back in the day, they basically committed themselves to be a lifelong learner and a follower of that particular rabbi. And their ultimate goal was to become exactly like him. See, the mission is to turn men into disciples, and specifically disciples of Jesus Christ. So the goal is to make every believer look like and act like Jesus. And we're told to do it as we're going. This is a life's mission. This is our life's mission everywhere that we go. This is it. And again, as you're going, go and go, it's not the main verb. It may seem like it. But again, as you're living every day, we're called to penetrate the darkness with the light. Satan's substitute, I'm afraid, a lot of times is instead of going and telling, 
it becomes come and hear. And so everything gets focused on this building. See, I don't know about you, but I realize through COVID and we, we've lost a, a, quite a bit of people. And anyway, it's, it's sometimes hit or miss with others. But here's the thing. I, though, look out into this room, and you know what I see? I don't, I'm not frustrated by who's not here. I look at you, and I see who is here, and I see a vast amount of potential in this room. I'm talking a vast amount of potential in this room. And you don't have to come up with a vision. You don't have to come up with a plan. All you have to do is have a heart that's willing to act on his vision and his plan. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30, write that down. That's an invitation to discipleship. Come unto me, all ye who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. What does he say? Take my yoke upon you. We try our best to describe that, right? Like, you know, an oxen and how you'd use a yoke and Jesus come get hooked up with me. And essentially that is what, he, what he's calling people to do. But when he says, take my yoke upon you, you notice he also says, come learn from me. You see, a yoke for a rabbi, a a yoke for a rabbi was basically his perspective, the way that he looked at life. So Jesus is inviting people to come alongside of him, and he's saying, hey, come look at the world and life the way I do. Learn from me, and hey, what will you find? You will find rest. You see, some of you can't find rest because you're allowing the world to be the loudest voice in your life. The world is who you're listening to. But Jesus said, if you'll just listen to me, as a result, you'll find rest. And not just rest, but rest for your soul. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. It's an invitation to be a disciple. So here, listen, especially those of you that... that, that, You know, we've been talking a lot about this. Like, we are called to basically take the position of Christ. We're called to take his position. That's what his disciples did. He's no longer here, so we're called to step into his role and do what he did while he was here. The Bible says this mission is to take place in all nations. So what is our vision? How big is our vision here? Is it just the community or is it the whole world? See, God wanted to instill, Jesus wanted to instill in his men a vision for the whole wide world. Because when you follow his vision and follow his plan, then every single person, you may not see it, but every person in this room has the opportunity to impact the entire world, right? through actually turning men into disciples. Because if I invest in you, and then now you are able to go on your own, what if your disciple comes to you and says, man, my job's moving me to India? What do you say at that point? You say, glory, hallelujah. Because now you, you thought you would never get to India, but now guess what? You're going to India through somebody you invested in. And we forget that. We, we, the enemy has substituted missions for us just showing up, giving our money, and just paying the Southern Baptists and all the Southern Baptist missionaries to do it. No, the mission is the same for all of us. To the nations, baptizing them, enlisting them, putting, putting on the uniform. That baptism is a picture of death to the old life and a resurrection to the new life. See, the devil has tried to ruin this baptism by trying to make it a requirement for a person to be saved. No, that's not what it is. You're enlisting in the journey. You're enlisting in in not just, I'm going to heaven now, but man, I have have made the decision to follow Jesus. This is the beginning of my new life with him. Then it says we're to teach them. We're to say to them what Jesus said. The longer I continue in this journey, man, that's what I want to do is just say what God says in his word. It's an investment. It's a transferring of the truth to someone else. But you're not just teaching them. You're teaching them so that they'll what? What does it say? Observe that they'll do everything Jesus says for them to do. That's the mission in a whole. And Jesus says, I will always be with you. He's looking for a body. He's looking 
for a body through whom he could work through. Just like Jesus made himself available, we have to put ourselves in that position. We have the mission. It's there in the text. What's the problem? The problem is we're not in the right position. Our heart's not in the right place. Let's go back to 17. When they saw him, what happened? What put them in position to receive the mission? They worshiped him. They worshiped him. Go back to chapter 28, verse 9. Jesus in this chapter has now been resurrected. He who was dead now on the third day has come back to life. And in verse 9 it says, And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them saying, Rejoice. So they came and they held him. Now notice what they're doing. They're holding him by the feet. And it says they worshiped him. That, that word, there's a guy, uh, Jim over here, was talking about it Wednesday night. And, 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 and that word literally, when you look at where it's used in other places, like they're there holding his feet. So the word can actually mean to kiss like a dog licking his master's hand. Now, I'm not saying they're licking the feet of Jesus physically or all of that, but they are at his feet. And they're rejoicing in the fact that he who was dead is now alive. And things are starting to make sense. Things are starting to come alive. This is the Christ. The word here for worship means to fawn. And I'm like, to fawn? I'm like, well, I know what a fawn is. A fawn is the, the, a baby deer, right? <laughs> so what does it mean to fawn? And so here was the definition. It means to give a servile display of exaggerated flattery or affection. Now, I don't know, again, I'm a little slow, so I got to look up things like, well, what's, what's this mean? Or what's, so, so when you look up what the word servile means, it means this, which is mind-blowing. An excessive willingness to serve. An excessive will, like an over-exaggeration expression of this affection and just this willingness, like, I'm here. You are the Christ. Whatever you say, oh, I'm here to do it. See, we can't get the mission accomplished today with a lot of the people sitting in the pews because we're not in this position. Now, that's a hard word. It's hard for every single one of us in this room. But the question is, God, or the, the point is, God is moving us there. He doesn't want you to be among those doubting, hesitating, holding back. Because here's what I found interesting. This word, therefore doubt, only occurs in the gospel of Matthew. The other use is in chapter 14, verse 31, where if we had time, you could go there and read it. But basically what it is, it's where Peter walked on water. You remember Peter, he walked on water, then he lost his nerve because he looked away from Jesus to the angry waves and the storm, and he began to do what? He began to sink. He began to waver. He began to hesitate. After rescuing Peter, the Lord says to him, O oh, you of little faith. He says, why did you doubt? Peter, why did you hesitate? Peter, why did you waver in that moment? Why did you doubt it? You see, it seems incredible that anyone faced with the overwhelming evidence of a risen Jesus could still have hesitated, but some did. Some did. And I really believe that God is wanting us to see the reality of this thing. Is that, man, this, this is... This is this is Jesus we're talking about, the one who has all authority, the one who deserves all of our heart, all of our affection, the one who deserves for us to bow before him with, with, with what? With an excessive willingness to do whatever he tells us to do. You see, there's a lot of us, we, we, we climb the wall and we, we look over there at the mission and we say, that's awesome. And some of us, we dabble in it from time to time, but we understand that on the other side of the wall, you know what's there keeping us from it? It's death to ourself. 
It's the end of all other pursuits. It's the end of every other chase in our life. And it means giving everything to go after what he's called us to do. And we peek over and we see it and we say, oh, no. That is going to cost me everything. And don't you think for one second that I'm not sharing this out of my own heart and my own conviction and where I've been in my own life. We see it, we say it's good, but we still chase other things. See, what I've realized is that what God is doing is he's bringing his church back to the heart of worship, the right position. Oftentimes today, we see worship as synonymous with music. We see worship as something you do on Sunday mornings or with a gathering of other believers, you know, whether it's here or whether it's in some other place or some other thing that's going on. But if we read the Bible, which, man, I encourage you to do, you will find that worship is much more than music. Worship is much more than an experience. Worship is much more than an event that takes place on Sunday morning or some other time at a conference or an event. Music and Sunday morning gatherings or gatherings as a whole, man, I'm telling you, they're powerful, they're valuable. Valuable, but hear my heart. They're only powerful and valuable as they truly foster worship in your heart. So I don't want to come in here criticizing people's way of doing worship because we do that differently. We do that differently in different places, different traditions. But I'm telling you, whatever we're doing, if you go there and you have a great time and it's awesome and you say, God spoke to me, I just want you to understand, worship didn't happen until you start obeying what he says. That's the biblical way of looking at worship. Worship is essentially a heart that follows and obeys Jesus. That's worship. You see, music can be an expression. All these other things you do, giving, and all, that can be an expression. But how much of us have lost it? Let's just say, how many of you gave today because you're scared to death that if you didn't give, God was going to make life a living hell for you the following week? I mean, how many of you, you, you give because you're scared not to give? That's not worship. We give because he's worthy. We give because we know that his mission is worthy. We give because we we, we want to support what God's doing, whether it's here or wherever. Jesus says something to the Pharisees, the religious leaders at the time, that has really hit me very, very hard in recent days. Matthew chapter 15, verse 8, you can write it down, go back and read it. But his, these Pharisees are just giving him a fit. And in this particular occasion, they want to know, Jesus, why do your disciples not follow the tradition of the elders? Why, when they come in here to eat, why are they not just going through this elaborate ceremony of washing themselves up like, well, like we've put in place? It wasn't even God's law. It was really a law of man. And so Jesus basically comes in and he quotes Isaiah And in chapter 15, verse 8, here's what he says. Here's what Isaiah said about the people that he's speaking to. He says, these people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. They honor me with their lips, but their heart is... See, the only way I know to say it is this. I, I can be in this room, and I can, I can say we have a story to tell. And I can say, you know, hey, go and tell the world about it. I, I can say it all. And, man, we can have fun with that. And we say amen to that. But God is not looking for lips that will confess it. He's looking for a heart that will obey it. As a matter of fact, I believe that sickens God. For us to go through the motions and sing about something that we have absolutely no intention of doing. You see, the call to worship is not a rally to come and see a performance like some people would think. Like some of us, and I'm guilty, oh, the worship was great. Oh, you've got to hear those. Almost as if the better the voice, the better, like, the wor- no, 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 no. That, that, that's a, you're misunderstanding worship. 
God's not looking at the voice. He's not listening to the voice. He's looking at the heart. He's looking for hearts that are fully surrendered to him. See, because all of those words that you read in the, the Old Testament, all of them talk about worship is coming and bowing down or kneeling or laying prostrate before, like that physical action. But God doesn't just want that. He's talking about the posture of your heart. So let me ask you something. Is your heart filled today with an excessive willingness to do what the master's called you to do? Is it filled with a love and a reverence and an awe of him who has loved you so much in spite of you? Hey, by the way, when Adam and Eve were out there hiding in the bushes, blaming each other, blaming the devil, I don't see any time when they ever came out and finally said, okay, God, we're sorry for what we've done. We own up. No, they never did that according to the text. But you know what God still did? He still killed an innocent animal and he still provided a permanent clothing for their shame and their nakedness. He still did it. The right position for the mission. It's the position of your heart. A heart bowed in total surrender to Jesus. Ready to hear and do whatever he commands. He's bringing us back to the heart of worship, church. Because unless we get in the right position, the mission will go unfulfilled. Just keep doing our own things. So to truly worship is to love God and keep his commandments. I I, I don't know how to emphasize. We're not talking about your salvation here. We're talking to the people of God, right? I want to tell you something. Please hear what I'm about to say because we're about done, all right? But I want you to learn to hear and read everything with the cross in view. Do, do you understand what I mean? You need to hear and read everything you do, like whether it's your Bible or, 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 or listening to other people teach, you need to hear all of that, read all of that in view of the cross, a finished work, meaning Jesus did everything that needed to be done to make you right with God. You were left with nothing to do but receive that gift into your life, ladies and gentlemen. You have got to see everything, read everything, hear everything in view that a finished work has already taken place. So that you are free to hear this. But we are under obligation not to earn our salvation, but we have a mission. You see, the original 12 took Jesus' position. They became Christ to the world. As a matter of fact, in Acts 17, the world looked at them and said, we call you Christians. You're little Christ. We had one, but now we look everywhere and they're all over the place. We are to take the same position. Paul did this. Paul said in Romans 1 verse 14, I am a debtor to the Greek and the Jew, to the Jew and the Greek. Did he not? He said, I am obligated to the entire world because I have been blessed with the greatest treasure possible. And God has obligated me now through the mission to pass it on. I am obligated. You and I have got to learn to start living as if we are the only ones. I would love for everybody in this room to get it, but I have got to accept the fact that that I might be the only one. Does that make sense? Because a lot of times we're thinking, well, somebody else is doing that. Somebody else is making sure this thing continues to future generations. Really? Is that the mindset Paul had? No, Paul saw himself as the only one. And that's the way he went after it. That's why he went after it with the intensity and the passion that he did. But we're not ever going to do this if our heart is not in the right position. As I said in the beginning, it's not our vision, it's not our plan. God is just simply looking for those who will bow their heart to him, step in, and be obedient. For me, what seems to continue to compel me and drive me and what I'm doing 
is God himself. It's what God has blessed me with over the years to learn about him. And so he took me inward into his heart. So now I realize that he can move me outward to the rest of the world. So God is calling many of you inward into the very heart of God to get to know God in a real way so then he can move you outward to the world that's around you. And somebody may say, how do I really know the heart of God? How can I know? You know how you know? Look at Jesus. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you have seen the Father. Study the life of Jesus. That there's one thing I do all the time, repeatedly, over and over again. It's read the Gospels. Because when I look at the life of Jesus, I know that I'm seeing who my Father truly is. I'm getting the most accurate picture possible. So maybe that's where you need to start this morning. It's, Father, I just really want to know you. Maybe that's the reason you're not going outward to others. I heard a statement. And Breezy, I don't know if it was something that you sent to me or not, but, but you have to bear with me because I hear a lot of things, read a lot of things, and sometimes I don't necessarily get back to exact, but I, but, I, but I am reading it. There was a guy that was preaching, and he made this statement. And I don't remember what kind of tree he used, but he said, what do you think about this statement? I want to make peach trees that reproduce peach trees. And he was asking his congregation, what do you think about this statement? And of course, you couldn't hear really in the message of people reacting much, but you know, he started kind of filling in the lines of what people were saying, like, well, it's redundant, doesn't really make sense and all this, because we know that peach trees do what? Naturally. They produce peaches, right? But as I was just thinking through all of that in terms of looking that as a disciple, because it's crazy to say, I want to make disciples that make disciples. It's really the same concept. Because to be a disciple of Jesus means you're going to take the position of Jesus, which means you're going to reproduce his life in the lives of other people. But here's what I did think, Brian, you'll appreciate this. Brian has a lot of apple trees in his yard. Matter of fact, Brian has a pear tree in his yard. And if I'm not mistaken, this past year was the first time there was one pear on that pear tree, right? Essentially? Okay. But how long has that tree been in your yard? 14 years. Did y'all hear that? So think about it in terms of that in our lives. Why are people not turned out to the world carrying out the mission? Well, think about it. Why are their lives not fruitful? Well, if you think about it in terms of an actual believer, number one, it could be due to maturity. They're still in that process of growing up to where they're learning and realizing what God has called them to do. Another thing, and I'm sure Brian would, would, would agree with me on this, it could be that the fact that the tree is unhealthy. So my point in bringing all this up to you is just to simply say, if I'm not reproducing disciples, then am I willing to evaluate what is the problem in my life? And I used to have this counseling professor that would always say, you could always trace people's problems back to a worship problem. And you know what? I kind of understood that, but this week, guess what? It clicked for the very first time. Everybody's problems boils back to a worship problem if you understand worship. Because here's here's what I know about many in this room. You can't carry out the mission because you're too busy worshiping your job. your, your, Your job deserves all the value and all the attention of your life. So you, you, you can't carry out the mission because your job has become the object of worship in your life. Some of you can't do it because your hobbies have become the worship of your life. You bow down to it. Every, it, it controls everything that you do. You really don't have time because you're too busy. For some of you, and I know this is going to sound strange and weird, for some of you, parents, it's your kids. It's your own kids. Now, I'm not saying you don't love them, you don't care about them, but the problem is you can't carry out the mission because you've now bowed down to them. And so whatever they want, you're, just, you're, just, you're, you're sacrificing everything in your life to give it to them. And you say, doggone, Matt, that's hard to hear. But you know what? I love you. I care about you. I want you to experience life. I don't want Satan robbing you of life. 
And for some of you young people, it's more about how you're portrayed on social media. It's more about how you're looked at in a relationship that you're in or the friends that you have. You've bowed yourself down to that. So really, here's the thing. It's a worship issue because here's what you were created for. You were created to bow down to God and God alone. To Jesus and Jesus alone. To the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit alone. That's what you were created for. That's why the first commandment says, you shall have no other gods before me. So the question is, will we get in the right position so that we can fulfill the mission? Will we become true worshipers who lay down before the worthy one with a heart desiring to hear and do whatever he says to do? I I don't know about you, and I realize walking this aisle and whatever else, it it can be just as much of a show as anything else. But ladies and gentlemen, there's got to be some point for all of us when we stop trying to make the Christian life what we want the Christian life to be. I, I love what people do for people physically, helping people. That's great. But, but, but let me ask you this. What would you do if you heard about this about me? If you heard that I found out about a family that was homeless, that didn't have anything, and you found out that me, with my own money, I came alongside of this family, I got them a place to stay, I got them close to, to where for a, for a week's worth, I got them enough food for a whole month, I, I paid their bills and everything. If you heard, you, you know, and did all of that, right? You might be going, yeah, way to go, preacher. But what if you heard that they were lost and I was unwilling to tell them about Jesus? I mean, because which would you rather have? Would you rather them be homeless and saved or have a house and be unsaved? I know what you're thinking. I want them to have both. And yes, that's the point. But they can never call out to be saved by the one that they never hear about. They can't do it. So, Father, we hopefully today approach you with a humble heart, knowing that in this room today, what has been presented is your truth and so I just pray for people all over this building Lord to number one maybe they need to be saved maybe they've never been confronted with the reality that they're a sinner and that they're spiritually dead and that Jesus is the only one who can save them maybe they just need to come this morning and recognize and ask the question how Can I be saved and want to know more? But for the believers, Lord, I pray that we will truly posture ourselves, our hearts, in a true position of worship to you. God help us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.